This show is intended for general purposes only as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations or solicitation. When discussed, past performance is no guarantee or indication of future results. Nelson Financial Planning offers security through Nelson IVES Brokerage Services, member FINRA, and SIPC. Good Sunday morning. This is Bud Hedinger. Next on News Radio 1025 WFLA, the longest running radio show in Central Florida. Dollars and Cents with my good friend Joel Garris from Nelson Financial Planning. You can call him at the office this week at 407-629-6477 to schedule your free consultation to discuss your retirement plans. Or you can talk to him right now at 407-916-5400. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the program Dollars and Cents. My name is Joel Garris, and for the next hour, you're going to listen in on News Radio 1025 WFLA as we cover a variety of topics. We'll talk about retirement income. More than one third of the folks out there that are approaching retirement don't really have a strategy to replace their paycheck. So we'll talk about how you develop a strategy to replace your paycheck. Uh, We'll also talk a little bit about the new 1040. Uh, The uh, first draft of it was issued out by the IRS this past week, and it obviously has a lot of changes because of all of the changes for 2018 taxes. And then we'll recap uh, the week that was, but I guess in order to recap the week that was, we probably want to recap the quarter that was. Hard to believe it's July the 1st this morning, and so that means we have officially gotten into the back half of 2008. So far, the markets for the year, uh, relatively flat. Uh, Dow's down a little bit. S&P 500 is up a little bit. Uh, The NASDAQ, which is generally thought of as more tech-oriented, is up over 8% on a year-to-date basis. So as you look and listen to those numbers, what it really underscores is the importance of making sure that you have a good balance between more that growth side of investing and that value side of investing. The value side has a tendency to be a little more dividend-oriented. The growth side, those companies are taking their profits and putting them back into their own businesses. So from that perspective, you want to have a little bit of a balance. Certainly when you look at the performance of the market's So far this year, it appears that the growth folks have the upper hand, but you certainly want to have both of those asset classes. If you're light on the growth side, well, you're not participating in as much of what's going on in the market, particularly so far this year, because it appears that the growth folks are kind of moving ahead these days. So as we take stock of where we are uh, so far this year, you've got a number of policies out there between uh, the corporate tax cuts that were enacted at the end of 2017 and uh, the uh, spending bill that was passed by the federal government in February. Those two items appear to be adding about $285 billion in fiscal stimulus to the U.S. economy this year. So that's pretty good. Then you've got higher corporate profits uh, approaching over 25% and capital expenditures, which is the amount of money that companies spend on things like equipment and factories and capital goods, meaning stuff that will stick around for a while, is in fact on the fastest pace in seven years. So when you stop and check the economic temperature, 
uh, there's certainly plenty of things to be thankful for. Uh, There is also, of course, things to be concerned about. Chief among them is the interest rates and inflation. So what's interesting, one of the key measures of inflation that the Federal Reserve observes uh, actually sort of broke or, or hit its target observation rate for uh, the month of May, which is the first time that that had happened in six years. So so what's holding the market back, I think, a little bit these days is this concern as you start to see inflation and you start to then see a, a faster increase of interest rates by the Federal Reserve. And nobody likes that because that means that your borrowing is going to be more expensive. So certainly some things to watch in terms of inflation and interest rates. And then, of course, uh, on the trade front, a lot of perspective on that. Uh, our markets have, have, to a certain extent, sort of shrugged it off, not not overreacted to it. They certainly drifted downward for the month of June, but for the second quarter as a whole, that three-month run, uh, you had the broad-based market measured by the S&P 500 up about 3%. So not, not certainly not a, a, a severe negative reaction to it. And meanwhile, uh, so, so in, on our side of the equation, it seems that the markets are kind of taking this trade conversation in somewhat stride. And meanwhile, if you go across the the, the way uh, to the folks over in China, uh, their stock market is uh, saying a little bit different story. So there, China, the Chinese stock market, the, the Shanghai Composite, uh, is down more than 20%. Uh, so perhaps that gives some perspective on this trade conversation, uh, that in fact those tensions appear to be weighing more heavily on the Chinese market. So so an interesting little perspective on what's going on over in China that you don't necessarily hear a whole lot about, because I think the media in our country has a tendency to be very fixated on what's happening here without a whole lot of perspective on what's going on around the world. And certainly that would be the case when you start to see and hear some of the market reactions that are in fact happening in China in reaction to this trade conversation. So to be continued, obviously, as as we have said before on the program, We suspect that a lot of this trade conversation is just that. It's just incredibly boisterous negotiation tactics uh, that you are seeing from an administration that sort of likes to play the game that way, which is a different way than we've seen other presidents play it. And I think that's one of the reasons why you hear so much about it is the media just kind of grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds. So for for some real perspective, think about the numbers that I said for this quarter, right? So the S&P 500, broad-based market, up 3%. Do you know what the average investor did? <laughs> the average investor clearly got overexcited about the trade conversation, despite the fact that the market wasn't really overreacting to it. And instead, in the month of June, pulled over $12 billion from global stock funds in that month. That is, in fact, the highest level of withdrawals out of global stock funds since October of 2008. To put it into a little bit of perspective, in October of 2008, it was the very height of the financial crisis. That month opened the first week with a 20% decline because Congress decided to vote down TARP on the Monday when they were expected to approve it. 
So then they voted it down. They said, oh, no, we're not going to approve this expenditure. And guess what happened? The market reacted pretty negatively. So by Friday, the folks in Washington said, wait a minute, maybe we didn't really make a good decision. Let's have another look at that thing. And so on Friday of that first week in October of 2008, they voted for it. Now, they had to put some different stuff in it to sweeten it and all that. But the reality is that the damage was done. And certainly that was a pretty dramatic period of time. So to see these statistics that say that investors are pulling their money out of the market in a quarter that where the the overall markets were up 3%, they're pulling out their money from global stock funds, the highest level since October of 2008, when clearly it was a much more dramatic situation. That just continues to underscore... The problem that people have with investing and achieving their goals over time is because they get distracted from them and they swallow the headlines, even though in this particular case, the market hasn't really overreacted to these trade war conversation headlines. And yet they reacted and pulled the money out. That's fantastic. They're going in to cash where they'll make nothing. In retirement, if your assets are making nothing or next to nothing, you're not having nearly as good a retirement as you could be having. Some perspective on uh, the quarter that ended and uh, this past week. We will continue the conversation, uh, and look ahead to this week. i uh, got a big holiday, July 4th, right smack in the middle of the week. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then also talk about the new 1040 and what the big changes are on the form itself. So stay tuned for that. And then if you would like to add your topic To our host of topics today, get in touch with us, 407-916-5400 are the numbers to call in and be a part of the program. You can also dial 855-545-1025, or you can send me an email at joel at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. We'll be back right after these messages. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen, Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. I am your host, but I have a list of topics to chat about. But if you would like to add your topic to the conversation, give us a call, 407-916-5400, 855-545-1025, or simply send us an email. That email is my first name, Joel, J-O-E-L, at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. That's how you can get in touch with us. Uh, in, the last, in the prior segment, we recapped sort of the week of the month and the quarter that was. Hard to believe we're at July 1, halfway through uh, the year. As we look ahead uh, to this week, 4th of July, right in smack in the middle of the week, which is kind of an odd, well, it's not that odd because it happens every seven years, but um, it, when it, when the holiday like that kind of falls in the middle of the week, it, it, it's just throws scheduling and planning and all that kind of stuff off because you just don't know what to do with a holiday in the middle of the week. You got like two days of work and and like a day off and then and then two days of work. It, it's kind of odd when that falls on um, a Wednesday. And then for the financial markets, they actually 
they actually will close early on uh, Tuesday. So it's one of those days where uh, the markets are actually closing early at one o'clock. Um, there's a couple of other times that they do that, uh, usually like the day before Christmas, again, depending upon when the calendar falls. Uh, but often when kind of a, a, a federal holiday falls on a on a business day and it's got a business day before it, then uh, often you'll see uh, the markets close early. So the markets, in fact, on Tuesday close at one o'clock. Um, and so then then you've got the holiday. And of course, on the holiday, July 4th, markets are, are, are closed completely. Uh, and then in terms of, of economic data that's coming out this week, uh, it looks like on Friday, uh, there is um, the unemployment data uh, widely expected to continue to stay at 3.8%. When when you hear it, unemployment at three point eight percent, that that is just an incredibly low unemployment. I mean that, I mean if you're ever going to have an economic system that gets to full employment, I would submit that unemployment at three point eight percent is pretty darn close to that. Uh, in other news, don't know if you saw this one, um, Amazon bought a pharmacy. <laughs> Let me get this straight. So they bought a grocery chain. They buy a pharmacy. Amazon wants to be everything to you, and um, based upon their track record, it appears that um, they they might very well be. Uh, but if you didn't see that story, uh, that story came out last week. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, interestingly, one one of the reactions to it was that Walgreens, which we talked about last week, that had just gotten added to the Dow to replace GE, uh, <laughs> shares of Walgreens went Walgreens went down uh, dramatically uh, at once uh, that uh, that story broke. So so much for getting added into the venerable Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, to then have the upstart uh, whippersnapper. Well, it's uh, Amazon's not much of a whippersnapper anymore, but they, then to have the upstart Amazon take the wind totally out of your sails on that by saying, hey, well, yeah, hey, by the way, we bought a pharmacy too. Uh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> talk about a rough start to being a component of the Dow Jones Industrial. That was certainly the case for uh, Walgreens this past year. In other news this past week, as we mentioned on uh, earlier in the program, they did, in fact, issue out the new uh, Form 1040. Uh, this is the new form for 2018. Uh, the new Form 1040 uh, is going to replace all three of the prior 1040 forms. So so the, there's basically one form. It's a 1040. In the past, you had the 1040EZ. If, if there wasn't really much any, of anything on the return, and then you also had 1040A, which is sort of a step up from the EZ, uh, but, and then you had the 1040 when you had to kind of really fill out the tax return. Well, the, 10, the new 1040, and again, a lot of tax changes in 2000 at the end of 2017 where the goal was to simplify uh the tax code. I'm not sure that it simplified it as dramatically as uh what the folks in Washington like to profess, but it certainly did achieve some simplification simply by dramatically increasing the standard deduction, which means that most folks that were itemizing, meaning you sit down and you figure out what you gave to charity and what you took to goodwill and your taxes, your real estate taxes, your mortgage insurance, your medical expenses, and your unreimbursed employee expenses and uh, all that stuff, uh, and then put together your itemized deductions. Well, uh, that obviously takes time and that's a little bit more complicated and with a higher standard deduction, it, it just Fewer and few, fewer and fewer people. It's it, it just not going to make sense to spend all that time, effort, and energy because it's not going to get you anything more on your tax return, thanks to the increase in 
the standard deduction. So, so the new Form 1040 will, in fact, replace the three other versions of the 1040 that existed previously, the 1040, the 1040A, and the 1040EZ. So if you've done the 1040EZ or the 1040A in the past and you look for them when it comes time to file your taxes, um, yeah, you're not going to find them because they don't exist for 2018. There's only one Form 1040. The old Form 1040 had 79 numbered lines. One through 79. The new one has just 23. That's, that's a pretty big drop. Uh, that has enabled the, the, the designers, the folks at the IRS that kind of set up the format and all that, to, to basically um, have, a, a, if you were to print out the new Form 1040, it would basically be, the, the top half of an eight and a half by 11 sheet. The, the, so both sides of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, the, the form itself would only be on the top half, which again, you know, sort of fulfills the, the, the message of the new tax rules basically allow you to file on a postcard. Cause if you think of half a sheet of paper as sort of a postcard size, then that's effectively what this redesign of the 1040 does. So, so the front page, which has traditionally been just kind of your name and then and then and and, and the income, okay, and then the back page has been sort of the deductions and the credits and things like that. All of that has changed. The front page now is just your name and your kind of your information. It's also where you sign the return. OK, uh, it used to be that you'd sign on the on the on the second page, sort of at the very, very bottom, sort of underneath all of the numbers. Uh, they've moved that signature block to the front page. So basically, the front page is um, is all your data, your name, address, date of birth, social security number, the kids, the dependents, and then your signature. And then uh, and then on the second page is uh lines is the rest of the 23 is the 23 lines where uh you're putting in your income and and the, and the income part sort of starts to sort of flow somewhat familiar with what what most people are with the 1040 um but the one of the ways in which they were to get from 79 lines down to 23 is um the new 1040 comes with six additional schedules or forms that many will have to attach to the main form, okay? If you've got a very simple return, then then you won't need to worry about that. But one of the ways in which they sort of took 79 down to 23, I mean, you, I mean, you can't just make those 56 other lines just completely disappear. I mean, some of them did disappear as a result of the tax changes, but not but not 56 out of 79. So um, what they did was they then will refer you to uh, completing a schedule, which will basically be as an attachment. So, so there's six additional schedules uh, that, that many will find that they've got to, um, to, to, to file. Uh, One of the, I guess the, the comments on the form is you, you, you better know what you're doing because even though it's sort of simpler in that it's got less lines and less places, a lot of those deductions and credits and things like that still very much exist. So it's going to be incumbent upon you to make sure that you're using the right schedule to be able to claim that. Uh, otherwise, you could very well have a deduction that um, – that that you know might you just might forget because you don't remember you don't realize that there's a new schedule out there uh things like student loan interest things like that i mean that no longer appears directly on uh on the front page so you really need to pay particular attention even though it's simpler you've got to make sure that you're grabbing the right schedule and completing that in order to 
make sure that you're getting and taking advantage of all of the various uh, deductions that are available to you. Because it's not like when you are just dropping them on the return because, oh, there's a line that says that. Uh, In fact, you're going to have to pay a little bit more attention. And, And the reality is that most of this stuff is done uh, by computer program anyway. I mean, eighty-nine uh, percent of households file electronically, so that means that that for the vast majority of people, they're doing going online, or they're using a tax software, or they're using a a, a paid preparer to prepare their taxes. And a lot of that software, and and certainly on the paid preparer side of things, you, you, they'll be able to kind of pick up those deductions and make sure that those stay consistent um, or get added to your return. But certainly, uh, certainly some big changes and, um, and you're already starting to see where a simpler uh, tax code could very well reduce the amount of, of, of money or the amount of people that have to have um, their taxes prepared Professionally, H and R Block recently, for example, recently announced that it was closing 400 offices. Uh, as as that tax law reduces the com- complexity, and as more people shift to digital tax preparation, uh, a word of warning though on that um, with 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 the addition of these six other schedules, you've really got to make sure that you are pulling in all pieces of the picture on your tax return because it's not going to be as laid out on the form itself as it previously has been. So, so some interesting, um, some interesting uh, changes to uh, the new form 1044, the year 2018. We got one other thing that we want to throw out there uh, that is also percolating around uh, Washington, D.C. in terms of, cost basis so we'll hit that when we come back from the break and then we will shift over to how to replace your paycheck in retirement so stay tuned for all of that here on the program dollars and cents this is joel garris of nelson financial planning and you're listening to news radio 1025 wfla This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dollars and Cents, and I am your host, Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. We do have open lines, 407 916-5400, Nine one six five four zero zero toll free one eight five 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 four five one zero two five or like Peter just did during the break, you can email us at joel at nelson financial planning dot com. Joel at nelson financial planning dot com. That's how you can send us an email. Peter will get right to your email in just a second. I uh, just wanted to throw out there uh, the latest uh, idea floating around uh, Washington, D.C., uh, involving capital gains and capital gains tax. Now, here's why I don't think this idea is going to really have a whole lot of momentum. Uh, capital gains rates are, are, historic, are at their historically low rates anyway. I mean, if you're in the lower income tax brackets, which generally married couple uh, making around a hundred grand, uh, you're going to be in those lower tax rates, income tax rates, where uh, the capital gain rate is zero percent. Well, you, you you can't get any lower than zero, right? Um, and then even if you're in the higher income tax rates, uh, your capital gain rate is at fifteen percent, uh, and obviously at very high income levels that. Uh, capital gain rate can go up to 20%. And then with the extra uh, Medicare tax, it can, in fact, become 23.8. That's a whole lot better than the highest income tax rate at 39.6%. That's pretty pricey. Uh, The concept that's floating around in Washington, uh, which I don't think it has much legs, but we put it out there just so you're aware of it, 
is the suggestion of a, allowing your cap your basis for capital gain purposes to adjust for inflation. So let's say you bought something, a property or a stock, you know, thirty odd years ago. You put ten grand in; uh, it's worth a hundred grand now. If you were to sell it, you'd have a ninety thousand dollar capital gain. That's a traditional way of doing it. Under this suggestion, you would be able to take the ten thousand and ultimately adjust it for inflation. Inflation at three percent per year. So you would be able to maybe adjust that original purchase of ten thousand uh, with the with the inflation adjuster. Maybe you could get that up to twenty or twenty five thousand. I mean, you're still going to have a big capital gain, um, and, but there is some adjustment on the cost basis uh, for uh, inflation. Unlikely that that is really going uh, to um, to shift uh, because that seems like it wouldn't necessarily move the needle a whole lot. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the folks in Washington need money, combined with the fact that capital gains rates are already at its historical low. But certainly, uh, to the extent that it is an idea getting floated out there, we certainly like to chat about that kind of stuff here on the program. Uh, also happy to talk about any topic that you want to add. And so Peter uh, reached out to us this morning um, and sent us an email in that last break with a great question. Um, and it's a conversation about IRA conversion after retirement. So uh, his email begins, my wife and I are 64 and can withdraw 40000 from our traditional IRA and remain in the 12% tax bracket. We are considering moving this money to a Roth. Is this a good idea? We have about 400000 in our traditional IRA and could do this annually for several years. Uh, great question. The reality is that the tax rates that exist starting well, in 2018 and going forward for the next few years, well, sort of for the next few years because folks in Washington can certainly change them, uh, are at uh, historical lows, right? Uh, your 15% income tax bracket, which was sort of the traditional bracket, is now, as Peter points out in his email, down to 12%. Uh, the 25 is now down to 22%. Uh, so that's, you know, that that's something to consider because if you are historically in a position where uh, your income tax rates are at the lowest that they've been, uh, then perhaps there is an opportunity to take the money out from the IRA pay that historically low rate of the 12% and ultimately then shift it on over to a Roth. So so I I understand the strategy um a couple of a couple of caveats on it. Um first and foremost, one of the things you've got to be very careful about when you add income to your tax return when you are retired is triggering additional tax on your Social Security. So one of the things that you want to look at is just how much of your Social Security is included as income because the amount of that Social Security that's included as income is really uh, uh, based upon sort of a sliding scale of how much other income you have. So if today you're only seeing a portion of your Social Security get included on your taxes. Uh, If you add $40,000 of income, which is what you would have to do uh, for for that conversion, you might very well, um, instead of only maybe 20% of your Social Security being included on your income, you might very well uh, trigger the maximum 85% of your Social Security being um, triggered as income on your tax return. So, Peter, make sure you, you, you double check where you are on the scale for Social Security uh, because you don't want to sort of 
double it up uh, because if you are in that zone where more and more of your Social Security gets taxable, you could certainly uh, find that, oh, well, I did you know, twenty thousand dollars on the IRA, but that now there's another twenty thousand of the Social Security that's included and that's taxable. So that would be one caveat. Um, sort of making the assumption um, based upon your email, Peter, that uh, you know you're doing fine in retirement. You've got enough money. You've got enough income, um, and, and that's why you're uh, considering doing this um, and also making the assumption that you don't have uh, any debt in retirement as well, because I would encourage you to uh, perhaps focus on uh, on getting rid of the debt uh, in retirement, because it's always good to to not have that uh, in retirement. Um, And then, yeah, so if I do 40,000 of a conversion and I'm going to pay 12 percent, so it's going to cost me basically close to five grand to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I get the tax strategy on it. I'm just never a huge fan of writing a check to uh, the federal government when, in fact, I didn't have to, right? You're electing to make a conversion, which means you are electing to make a payment to the government. I guess that always it kind of kind of chafes. I assume that the reason that you're doing this is to maybe help the help the beneficiaries, help the kids, uh, so they don't have to pay taxes, or maybe they're in a much higher tax bracket than you. And again, that that's a fair reason uh, to do that. But just some other things to kind of think about as you're running uh, the numbers on that. But great question, and 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 really a, a more powerful question, given how big of a change the tax rates are going to have this year for 2018 and uh, the fact that they basically puts them at historical lows. We'll slide to the break. Uh, We get back from the break. We'll tackle uh, some concepts on retirement income and uh, how best to replace your paycheck in retirement. So stay tuned for that here on the program. Dollars and cents. This is Joel Garris, Nelson Financial Planning, News Radio, 1025 WFLA. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen, Dollars and Cents. This is your host, Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. You're listening to News Radio 1025 WFLA. July the 1st, halfway through 2018. Wow. That happened quick. Certainly did for me. Uh, it probably did for you. These uh, these days, weeks, months have a tendency to roll by quite at a pretty good clip. Um, so this segment of the program, we'll talk a little bit about how to replace your paycheck in retirement. Almost half of the folks out there are are have in recent surveys have expressed concern about managing their retirement income to meet their retirement expenses. More than one-third of those retiring within the next five years don't have any idea how to recreate their paycheck. So we thought we would devote this segment of the program to giving you some concepts to start to put that process into place. First of all, from an investment perspective, um, you're not rich enough to retire on CDs alone. Let's just say it, put it, let's just say it, what it, you ain't rich enough to retire on CDs alone. Put $10,000 into a CD, you'll make $34 a year. $34, I mean, you can't even go out to dinner for that. Put in a money market account, 10 bucks. I mean, come on. So, First concept is when you look at your retirement income, you better also be looking at your investment allocation as well. Because if you're like most people, the vast, vast, vast majority, you're not rich enough to retire on CDs alone. Now, 
if you've got a hundred million dollars, okay, man, maybe you could, you know, maybe swing it. But no, not when a ten thousand dollar investment in a CD generates thirty four dollars a year based upon current CD rates. So don't forget to consider your investment allocation in this mix as well. But some of the first steps to really be able to start the process of figuring out how to replace your paycheck in retirement is coming to an understanding with, okay, what are my expenses and what are the nature of those expenses? So so if you think of it this way, you know, there's sort of three categories of expenses out there. There's there's your fixed expenses, which would be like your mortgage or car payment uh, or or something like that. OK, so your real estate taxes, your any of that stuff that that is roughly the same amount every single month. And you've got a plan for it and you've got to do it. So so those are fixed expenses. OK, uh, they don't really change from one year to the next. So regardless of what's happening in, to inflation or anything like that, um, they, they, they don't really, they're not really changing. The payment is the payment because the payment was set when you established the loan. Those fixed expenses are pretty important because usually they have to deal with housing or transportation or the like. So, so fixed expenses uh obviously you want to, you need to uh, need to start the retirement uh game with at least making sure that those are covered uh because those are the sort of the mandatory ones uh the next category is kind of those expenses that do go up over time that that are still a, a major part or a mandatory part of retirement things like food things like utilities things like health care the the problem with those is that they are in fact going up over time, which goes back to our concept of you can't retire on CDs alone because if you've got a major chunk of your expenses in retirement that are continuing to rise, well, then uh, best you have a way to combat combat that because those expenses uh, will, in fact, be going up. And then, you know, and then the discretionary stuff, right? I mean, I'm sure you want to retire to have fun. So whether that's playing golf or traveling or whatever that case may be, uh, then uh, you've got to also include that. And, and, And the notion is to think about your different expenses and the different types of expenses that we just described, the fixed expenses, the, the variable expenses, and then the discretionary expenses, and match those up with the different types of income and the different types of investments that are out there. We're going to have to continue this on uh, next week's program because the music means at this time of day that we are, in fact, out of time. So... We will continue the conversation of how to replace your paycheck in retirement on next week's program because I got to get out of here. Music's playing. So thank you all for listening. Uh, Peter, thank you for that email. That was a great uh, question. Uh, And uh, we will sign off uh, for this Sunday. This is Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. You're listening to News Radio 1025 WFLA. How have your investments performed over the past five years? Do you know? Are you happy with that number? At Nelson Financial Planning, we've been achieving investment results over the past 30 years using actively managed investments that we own personally. This is Joel Garris, and I invite you to review your investment results with us. Visit NelsonFinancialPlanning.com or call us today at 407 629 6477 to set up a conversation to review your investment performance. That's nelsonfinancialplanning.com or 407-629-6477 to set up that conversation.
A-plus Better Business Bureau accredited. Nelson Financial Planning offers securities through Nelson Ives Brokerage Services, member SIPC at FINRA. Listen to Joel Garris on Dollars and Cents every Sunday at 9 a.m. on News Radio 1025 WFLA. This show is intended for general purposes only as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations or solicitation. When discussed, past performance is no guarantee or indication of future results. Nelson Financial Financial planning offers security through Nelson Ives Brokerage Services, member FINRA, and SIPC.